You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, get ready to hit the option block. All right, everybody, that rock in tune means it is time to rock out with the Thursday edition of the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, on the ever exciting The Options Insider Radio Network. Glad you can join us here on this fun and festive Thursday. A lot going on, a lot to break down. Joining me to help me do just that. First off, We've got the man, the myth, the legend, a.k.a. Uncle Mike himself from St. Charles Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. I, I've heard a rumor you have something you want to share with us. Any, any truth to that rumor, sir? Never before in the history of the entire stock market has there ever been a better time to sell than today. I don't know how much more excited people can get. If that doesn't excite you, then good gosh, I don't know what will. <laughs> now, does that mean now is the best time to sell? Of course, we never know that because uh, we can't predict the future. However, we're at all-time highs, folks. Today is a good day for stockholders. It's a good day to sell. If you're a Klingon, it's a good day to die. All sorts of fun stuff <laughs> wrapped in together. Let's keep on rolling all the way out there. Not Maybe not so much Klingons, but maybe some Iron Thrones. We are joined once again by the song of ice and fire himself, Mr. Colin Songer from the Fidelity Active Trader Strategy Desk. Mr. Songer, welcome back to the program. Were you too derailed by the recent Hurricane Dorian, or were you guys okay where you guys were? Uh, well, being in New Hampshire, I was, I was pretty safe, so uh, I know... Uh, That's right. I keep forgetting you're not part of the Jacksonville team. You're part of the New Hampshire the New Hampshire squad. So you're pretty safe from the Hurricanes up there, I would believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. But our Jacksonville squad was uh, was safe, but uh, they did have uh, time away just to make sure that they stayed safe. So There you go. A little extra calls going the New Hampshire squad's way, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. You probably, were, you probably were shaking your fist at Dory and saying, what are you doing? Keeping me up all day answering these, these collar questions and everything else. All sorts of good stuff, though, at the end of the day. And last but not least, close to New Hampshire, New Hampshire adjacent. We could say 
is a wee little state called Maine, also known as the options mecca of the U.S., at least according to Google Trends data. We'll see if that. I haven't checked that recently, see if that's still the case. Maybe we should check your title there as we are joined by the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Line Capital, a.k.a. the guy who puts Maine on the map from an options perspective. Mr. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program, sir. Have you checked the Google data lately? Are you guys still number one? Actually, you know, it's just a picture of me. This is a picture of me in the Google data for options. They're like, this is where the this is where the option this is where the rock lobster lives, and this is where this is where the options happen. Hopefully, it wasn't a screen grab from that video you shared with us earlier, because that would have just disturbed. Um, yeah, the, you mean the top of my forehead video? Yeah, it's a good it's it's a good look. Listeners, you should be in on our on our show call because you get to see all sorts of unflattering shots of the rock lobster before the show. If you want, <laughs> if you ever want something to take you off your game right before showtime. He's a good one to have with you. All right, with the team assembled, let's dive right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, let's get into it. A lot popping off here this week. We've seen uh, our old friend Mr. Trump tweeting again about the ag markets We'll talk about that more on TWIFO in a little bit, talking about China may indeed be buying some more of our ag products again, which if you're in that marketplace or a farmer or like some of the traders I was just talking to yesterday who are big ag traders, uh, that's good news maybe for you. As a result of that, there was some lingering optimism for a deal on the trade war front. Doesn't seem like that's really the case. White House shooting down some of those rumors. Did have a little bit of a lift out there in the market as well after the ECB deciding uh, to keep going on the easing front. So that pretty much bring, bringing the world in line with everyone pretty much on the easing train, at least at least for the time being. All of that combining to put a little bit of green, actually a little bit more green on the screen. It was kind of wavering there for a while, up about a third of a point, or the percentage point, I should say, across the board. Now up a little bit more firmly, up over half a point. Looks like about six-tenths of a percent for the S&P, NASDAQ, in similar territory. The, all three of them, the Dow also right around six-tenths of a percent to the upside and of course that means actually gold rallying a little bit today too which is kind of interesting and crude taking it on the chin yet again been a rough week for wti again we'll get into more of that got some oil market makers joining us on twifo in a little bit so that should be fun and of course all this green on the screen means once again our old friend vix cash taking a rest taking a break deciding today is not my day i shall save up for another day, off about half a handle down to about 14, 14, 15 or so. That puts it off a little bit more than a point from last show, about 1.15 to be precise out there. So Val coming off. Uh, our old friend VIX though, getting a little bit of a lift. I mean, Val has been moving. At the end of the day, it's not just tracking the direction of VIX after all. It's actually tracking the volatility of those movements. And so VIX up a little bit, up about two and a third handles or so. And our old friend VXX, as you would expect. Coming in down 1.1 points. For everyone out there who was complaining about the VXX downside puts were too expensive, they, A, they were, but B, they actually ended up, for the most part, working out if you, uh, if you were patient and maybe had a little bit, of, little bit of savvy in how you were putting those bad boys on. But since he's so excited, and since it's pretty much it's his week, you know, we got all-time highs in the marketplace, we have silver moving, we got Apple making big announcements, Apple, of course, coming off. Their big hardware announcement for the year. We got new iPhones, new iPads, all sorts of good stuff. Apple TV services announcements, a lot of good stuff. So we got to go back to Uncle Mike because he's just too giddy. Uncle Mike, sir, what's cooking in this? I said last time it was like an Uncle Mike market. Now it's kind of like an Uncle Mike week. Are you celebrating over there in St. Charles? Uh, you know what? All those things you just mentioned are really cool. But the, the even better part is that my son's uh, got cleared by the doctors to play football again. He was having some knee and some finger issues, but he got cleared yesterday. So... Um, <clears throat> look out, Geneva North High School or Geneva North Middle School. You guys are on next on the list. We're going to see some stuff happen. I'm excited. Ah, the orthopedic joys of football. I, I remember them well. Ah, yes, ah, yes. But anyway, some things for today. Uh, what's happening? This is very news driven. In that uh, last night, <clears throat> news came out. If you were watching the futures last night, uh, news came out that um, uh, it seemed like we're getting friendly with uh, 
Mexican government in terms of the uh, the migrants and things like that, and um, markets rallied a little bit. Uh, today, they're talking about an interim trade deal with China, but then, no, we're not having an interim trade deal with China. Um, we have an easing in Europe with rates. Uh, we have, uh, oh, yeah, we have our own Fed coming up next week. So this is a very news-driven market, and these can be very exciting markets. Uh, well, they're always very exciting markets, even when they're boring markets, I think. But markets like this can be very... Very herky jerky, and that's a, that's a technical term that I like to use. In that, you really need to be prepared for a seventy point move either way in the marketplace. My opinion on it. Uh, oftentimes, when the storm starts to feel like it's calming down, uh, we're hitting new all time highs again. I think that a lot of times, what can happen with this is that if we get and we're getting these new all time highs based on news, if the news isn't good, if the market doesn't like it, it'll turn its back on you very quickly if you're a bull. Now, on the flip side, if the news remains good, if, uh, let's say, the Fed lowers rates like a lot of people think they're going to do next week, uh, if we continue to uh, just progress in the trade deals with China, uh, if we continue to delay tariffs or whatever the case may be, then, yeah, I think this market could have a pretty significant rally. But uh, as with anything, we're, we have the news that's really controlling this market. Now, we have earnings coming up in a few weeks, uh, so that is something that we can actually get a real feel of what stocks are valued at, what, they, what to look for, and whether we're actually doing well or not. But in the meantime, this is very much a macro news-driven market, uh, in my humble opinion. That's certainly the case. Tweets moving and shaking everything these days. In fact, uh, who is it? Is it uh, Morgan? Yeah, Morgan has created what they term the Vol Fefe Index to track how much Trump's tweets are moving the market. A lot of you are asking us about that. I'll probably get into that more, I would imagine, tomorrow on Vol Views. But effectively, this kind of goes, I think you can categorize this in, in the duh category. They say Trump's tweets have significantly increased volatility and the frequency of his market-moving tweets, tweets have ballooned in August. This data coming out, obviously, at the end of August uh, so as a result, they've created their Vol Fefe Index. <laughs> I don't know if they've made any material determinations yet, but fun and interesting nonetheless. And uh, Mr. Song of Ice and Fire, I know it's not fun and interesting covering for the squad that's stuck in hurricanes, but now that things are a little bit back to normal over there, this obviously an active week. I imagine for you guys, because one of your biggest names every day was in the news this week, Apple making some headlines that usually translates into a little bit of paper flow going on. So what was lighting it up over there this week in Fidelity Land, sir? Well, that's funny because uh, the top uh, orders by customers on uh, Fidelity.com was Apple. Good guess. How could I possibly Apple. know that, sir? It's like I've been doing this for a little while or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, um, you know, when they released their products, they had their little event there. Uh, you know, that just seems to be following through, um, you know, with the introduction of the new products, the streaming services coming out. Uh, so really the last time it hit this particular price level that we've seen today was October 10th of 2018. Uh, so uh, interesting enough, uh, Apple currently is, is uh, if you haven't guessed, uh, is at two twenty five forty. It's up a dollar eighty one, which is about eight tenths of percent, and it's above all its moving averages, and it's even breaking outside that upper Bollinger band. Uh, so there was the flip side of that is when you look at orders by customers, a customer forty five percent of them were buy orders, while fifty five percent were actually sell orders. Um, now, when we looked at the option statistics, uh, the Call to put ratio for volume was uh, one spot seven one uh, to one put, where its ninety day average was um, much more muted at one spot two two calls every one put. So a little bit more call activity happening on. Uh, next was uh, Aura. Now Aura uh, was trading at five ninety two, which was down about fifty seven cents. Uh, so. Uh, right now, it's holding above its 20-day moving average, but it's below its 50- and 200-day moving average. Uh, so it's trying to hold on to that level so it doesn't go below all its moving averages. Oddly enough, orders by customers, when you look at it, there was 64% of the orders were buys and 36% of the orders were sells. And the 
volume call to put ratio was sitting at a two spot nine five call to every one put traded, which is actually right in line with this ninety day average volume. Uh, but the actual volume has doubled its average volume so far today. Uh, next on the list was Roku. Uh, so Roku came in um, at one. It's right now currently trading one forty seven forty one, which is down two dollars and thirty five cents, which is just over one and a half percent down. Uh, it's holding above its twenty day moving average as well as the other moving averages, uh, but it's sitting right there on it. Uh, so that's something to, to certainly um, kind of monitor along the way. Uh, 64% of, of the orders were buy orders uh, compared to 36% being sells. Uh, the volume, um, I apologize, 57% buys to 43% of those orders were sells. Uh, it was sitting at uh, one spot, five, five calls, everyone put traded when we look at that call to put ratio compared to the one spot, three, one calls to one put for its 90 day average. Uh, so a little bit more activity that we're seeing out of Roku, not much. Uh, next was a volatility, uh, ETF that we have, uh, and that's the, uh, two times VIX short term, uh, TVIX. Uh, that's trading at, uh, 13 spot five, seven, and it's down about 60 two cents so far here today, which is over almost just under four and a half percent uh, down. Seventy four percent of the orders were were buy orders. Interesting. Uh, and twenty six percent were the sell orders. As you can imagine, it's below all its moving averages. It's nearing its 52 week low. Um, and that's kind of the story going on with uh, with that, which kind of makes sense. Well, what we're as we're seeing, uh, VIX have, having a rough go of it lately. Um, the when we take a look at the last one making the list, which is AT and T, and this is obviously around uh, some controversy around the major labor union uh, and their concerns with the Elliott, uh, Elliott management proposed restructuring plan. Uh, so right now. Uh, it's 50-50 in terms of the buy and sell orders. Uh, right now, it's trading 38 spot 34, which is down about 40 cents, which is just over 1%, uh, firming up as uh, compared to where it was earlier. Now, it's above all its moving averages and has broken above that top Bulger band. And right now, it's sitting right on top of that. Uh, it has created a 52-week high yesterday. And the uh, uh, volume call to put ratio is, is actually right in line with its 90 day average at uh, one spot, four, four calls to every one put. So that's what our Fidelity customers have been trading so far today. Thank you for that, sir. And last but not least, when you think of a Val Fefe, you think of this guy. <laughs> you think of the Rock Lobster. I know, Rock Lobster, I know, you, I know you're using that Val Fefe index already to drive your own trading, sir. But when you're not. Valfefeing to create a new verb. What's what's lighting up your tape and the tapes of your crazes in the pit chat these days, sir? Um. So the one thing about um, <laughs> the volatility trade. So there's two things. Is one is it's created a lot of vol of vol, meaning like VIX is real whippy. Um, which if you like to trade vol, which is good. But I think the second part is you know you you. Know, we haven't really gotten those sustained moves above 20. Like the futures really hasn't taken off. And, it, you know, if you if you buy any long side VIX, um, which I like to do when it's moving, um, it's been real disappointing on the upside. So if you didn't take the dollars. Um, so the problem with the Vol Fefe index, so we've all been kind of trading now for a year, I think, um, is – you don't get, except for the Volpocalypse, I guess, that was that was pretty nice in December. Um, but, you know, you, you need those big, you need those big moves in VIX to take larger gains. You just, or you have to be, uh, you got to be aggressive taking the dollars um, that you get. So I think part of it is, is we're not getting as big a upside pops in VIX as I would want. So, um Besides that, um, and then when he stops tweeting, uh, just like everybody's saying today, um, you know, the VIX goes down really fast. And we were actually saying 
like literally this morning, I must have been like 1030. I'm like, wow, like all the tweet, the stream of tweets has been really good. Like I can't let, will he make it to Friday before he creates an adverse tweet? And literally I'm like moving some stops around <laughs> and right as I'm doing it. It's like, oh, there's not going to be an early trade deal. <laughs> so um, I think as far as a slamming back and forth index, you know, like um, using it as like almost always as a contra indicator, like, okay, the, he tweets something, the market sells off. Yeah, it's kind of a buy opportunity. You know, he tweets something and everything's ripping and everybody's happy like it is right now. It's probably a, some kind of a sell opportunity, although the ECB, I think, is helping a lot. I wish they would stop. I'm, I'm glad Draghi will be gone. I hope Lagarde is a little bit more. No, we're not lowering rates anymore. We're going to start moving them back up and you can all be damned. I'm kind of hoping she says that. Um, but um, as far as a vol goes, I think there's, you know, there is, you certainly have a range for VIX. It's moving, but you have to be, you have to be, if you're going to trade the vol, you've got to sort of be on it and take your money when the direction is favorable. And uh, it, it's just, it's harder to, to go for the, the vol home run. It just, it hasn't been happening at least this year. It is hard for that home run. Just ask any baseball player. Hard to get those home runs. Let's see what's getting a home run today. I mentioned Apple was moving quite a bit, not opening up about one and a half handles today, so not lighting it up maybe in the tail end. It's the old buy the rumor, sell the product, sell the fact kind of thing. We're now on the tail end of knowing about what these products are, digesting them a little bit. Stock's still up, though, feeling the love, about seven-tenths of a percent, so pretty much right in line with what the broad NASDAQ is doing. Not a coincidence, Apple tends to be a good lion's share of these indices these days. So where it goes, the rest of the market tends to follow. Let's see what else is popping off here. This week, kind of light on the earnings front, we had GameStop on Thursday, excuse me, Tuesday after the bell. And then today we still have a couple. We got Broadcom and Oracle popping off after the bell. So if you're in the tech space, still not not done out there in the good old Duluth trading before the bell today. So if you're into your your work clothes over there, then perhaps that's one you're intrigued by over there as well. Still have some earnings move reports up there on the site, more coming in. I encourage you at this point, maybe go check out as well the earnings season report. That really breaks it all down in terms of how this season has been moving. And, you know, Matt was saying on our advisor show a few weeks ago that this is one of the more tumultuous seasons they've seen since they've been actually doing it. And certainly, and compared to you know, what the market's expectations are versus what's being delivered to the upside and to the downside. And you could see that broken down for you. In this earnings season report, overall, it's like for the whole season now, now that pretty much all, all of the weeks are, for the most part, in, we have every week except for one, we had the actual move out distancing the implied move on the, on the front, except for last week. Last week, it was 82%, so it was a little bit below. Every other week was over 100%, so it was beyond. Again, this is in aggregate. This is in mass, not any particular name. So net on the season, it was a 114%. In terms of outperforming, so more than the straddle. So interesting. So maybe we've, we see these, these cycles come and go where they contract vol a little bit, and then these things outperform, and then they widen it out for next time. That'll probably be the case. Next time we'll see some of these straddles maybe widen out a little bit, and then bam, they'll underperform, and it'll come back in again. But worth checking out nonetheless. Speaking of checking things out, we've talked about what Fidelity is trading. Let's see what the broad market out here is trading. Coming into showtime, we saw a fairly active day, all things considered. VIX pushing 350,000 contracts are pretty close to it. The ADV, again, we talked about that's come off quite a bit. It's come off a couple hundred thousand contracts in the last few weeks. So the ADV down to about 520. Again, it was about it was north of 720 just a few weeks ago. So it's come off quite a bit. Still tumultuous and still still seasonally strong, but not quite as strong as it was. Spy closing in on 2 million contracts. The ADV a little bit north of 3, about 3.1. SPX about 750,000 contracts. The ADV about 1.35, so closing in a little bit north of half there. The Q's doing 360,000 contracts. The ADV 655, so a little light in NASDAQ land, which is kind of interesting. And the IWM, a.k.a. the Russell Doing about 350, the ADV about 450 out there. And in terms of individual names, what is catching your attention today? Let's see if it's in line 
what the Fidelity folks are trading. Number one is, <laughs> let's see about the rest. Uh, number 10, good old Bob Bob, that CEO announcing he's retiring, taking his billions and getting the heck out of Dodge. Number 10, Bob Bob, 108,000 contracts on the tape. Number nine, Amazon, a buck 23 on the tape. Number eight, hot on its heels, Facebook, 126,000 contracts. Number seven, good old AT&T, kind of making every surgeon's back into the top 10 these days, 150,000 exactly. All right now, these are as of a few minutes ago, so these are pretty updated numbers. Number six, GE, buck 57 on the tape. Number five, AMD, 197, usually a top three this time. Only a mere top five, 197 on the tape. Number four, Tesla. You know them, you love them, or you hate them. Either way, you watch them. 208,000 contracts on the tape, dear. Number three, Bank of America, 218. Numero dos, Microsoft. Fighting its way up there today, 228,000. Number one with a bullet. We did talk about them before. Apple doing over half a million contracts, 540,000. So pretty strong paper out there. Let's see where your biases are today. Looks like pretty much all your love is for Microsoft calls, 80% of the paper out there. So 80% of almost a quarter of a million contracts come in on the call side of the ledger. So some folks loving themselves, some Microsoft. Meanwhile, we got to keep on rolling, see what else you guys are loving or perhaps hating. It is time to roll on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody welcome to the odd block once again the rock lobster and i leaping into the void no idea what the heck we're going to talk about we're just going to grab them and go see what the eye of sauron has given us today it's watching remember it's always watching and let's see first off here oh we have, we've just one i think was been on our radar not too long ago this name sounds familiar this is my land uh, this ticker symbol myl this is a global generic and specialty pharmaceuticals name registered in the netherlands in case you're Concerned about where they are registered. Uh, it looks like today they're selling off a little bit, about three cents, not a big deal. This name trading pretty much exactly 22 and a half part of the way through the show. Let's look back over the year and see what's been up out there. A year ago, they were trading nearly twice what they are right now. They were almost 40 bucks, and then they rallied up to their high of pretty much 39.60, so right around, they were right around their high about a year ago. And they sold off to about 31, then rallied back up to 37, and they kind of sold off again, this time to 26. So it's like a typical biotech pharma type chart here. Rallied up again to 32, sold off again. Uh, back in, looks like May was around their nadir for this name, around 1660 at the end of May. So they've rallied since then. They've rallied since the end of May, up about six and a half handles, including a pretty decent rally in the last, looks like in the last week or so from about... 19, 19 and a half or so up, 19 and a quarter actually, up to where they are right now, about 22 and a half. So a nice three and a quarter or so point rally just over the past week. So a little bit of upside love in the near term here for my land. Let's see if that's being borne out in the options activity that our Eye of Sauron found for us. Looks like, no, it is not. <laughs> Let's see. Well, actually, we don't know because this one kind of, uh, kind of split in the uprights here. It was... The Ock 17 half puts, these are going out on the 25th. Looks like these are in the weeklies. Unless we have a very, very late expiration cycle for October this year, which I don't think is the case. Let's see. Ock 17 half puts going up for 18 cents. This market, as you might imagine, was fairly wide coming out. It was 14 cents at 26. Bit of a weird market, too. Uh, So they were coming in four cents off the bid. Uh, opening over there on the Philly, it is worth noting this is done before earnings. So this does not have the earnings juice in it, which is interesting. If you're going to go all the way out to the 25th, maybe you'd want to have it a week or so later, get extra juice. Or maybe they've listened to us on the show and they decided to stay the hell away from earnings. <laughs> it's a safer play. Either way, earnings on the 5th here. So Mr. Rock Lobster, we're kicking things off. Looks like we got some kind of mid markety puts here in Mylan NV, it looks like they're leaning to the sell side, so maybe they're drawing that line at 17 and a half, which given this chart would make a heck of a lot more sense than perhaps buying them. But, you know, 
Maybe if they're buying them, you think they would want to have it go through expiration because that's where you have your most concern, obviously. So that probably reinforces the sale notion as well. What is your what's your spidey sense telling you on these on these pharma puts, sir? Um, I, right now I'm with like all these farmers. Like, wasn't Milan kind of the poster child for like bad drug company governance? They're <laughs> jacking everybody on those EpiPens. I yeah. remember two saw. Like, yeah, I think these were the ones. Wife, yeah. <laughs> Got to pay a thousand bucks for an EpiPen. I got to get a new one every year. If you know, for just a what I think was kind of like a generic um, antihistamine or whatever that's in it, but you know, and then they did the tax thing. And I don't know. This is just it's like one of these companies I just don't like. I mean, I know they're a drug company, they make drugs, whatever, but it it it, it has very bad optics. Let's put it that way. So. Um, the 17 put, and I think a lot of drug companies, look at the charts of most drug companies, maybe except for Amgen. Um, they just look awful. And like the Oxycontin companies, like, like they look awful. Or companies that even uh, generic Oxycontin, like um, just really, really, <laughs> really terrible. Um, so anyway, uh, long story short, I think this is a line of the sand put. I think they're like, it feels like the low end for the industry. Um, most of these stocks are at the lower end of the range, except for only a couple of the real stars. So that's what I think. Line of the sand put. Interestingly enough, while you were talking, I went back and looked to see the last time we discussed. Cause it sounds like it was fairly recently. It actually was a little bit farther back than I thought. It was May 13th where we discussed Mylan last on the show. And guess what we were talking about then? Mr. Rock Lobster, which is kind of relevant for today. We were talking about size, upside, love. It was the Oc 20s paper gobbling them up back in May. Uh, 5,4300 times through the offer for almost three bucks both times. So they were gobbling up these calls. They had to have them. And it uh, looks like right now they, they might have worked out. The interesting thing about these is that it looks like here, judging by the OI, these are still open. There's 36,000 of the Oc 20s open right now, Mr. Rock Lobster. So weird stuff afoot here in this name. Size now in the money calls opened back in May, but still open. I don't know if they're worth their three bucks now. I'll have to dig in and see. I mean, maybe in that recent sell-off, that trade wasn't looking so good, but <laughs> it has since looked better. Uh, so, yeah, in the last couple of weeks, those, those calls looking good again. So a lot of weird stuff. But we haven't talked about my land since May, but maybe... Those calls indeed still open, so perhaps interesting stuff afoot. We could spend more time talking about my land, but we got to keep on rolling, listeners. Let's see what else our eye of Sauron has delivered. You know, if biotechs, or should they bio, you know, pharmas aren't, aren't your thing, not enough vol fee. Let's go to tech. In particular, let's go DXC Technology Company. Uh, this is an American multinational that provides business-to-business IT services, so the sexiest of categories and sectors. Indeed, ticker symbol DXC. This is the name that right now is trading. Oh, not looking too good. Probably why her eye of Sauron delivered them to us today. They're trading 31 and a half off five bucks exactly. So nearly 14%. So not a good day here. Not a good day for DXC. Probably earnings. Again, I don't know what's driving this, but it is that time of year. So probably a bad earnings announcement here. Uh, let's look at the chart. A year ago, they were trading. Wow, a lot, a lot, nor, a lot higher than they are right now. They were trading over, over almost three x of this. So they were trading about ninety two, ninety three bucks. And so yeah, wow, a lot higher than they are right now. Their actual fifty two week high came ninety six seventy five, right around about exactly a year ago. And they pretty much sold off hard by the time Christmas Eve came around. They were trading almost half of that, fifty bucks even. And they kind of bounced off that for a while, trading about 65 again. Then they started selling off again back in April, sold off down to 47 and changed by May. And they kind of flirted around that level for a while. Then back in August, sold off hard again, down to 31. Pretty much where they are right now. They've been he- hovering around this level ever since until today when they're kind of uh, selling off again. Uh, so it looks like they had gotten some love back, rallied about five points from this 31 level, only to sell right back to it again today. So let's see what our Eye of Sauron brought us in. I had a feeling it was probably going to be puts, and that seems to be the case. It was the OC 25 puts going up for 26 cents. Not a bad fill on the day when the stock's selling off five bucks. 
Uh, these were 20 at 30. Got it for a penny off midpoint. That's not bad if you're buying these bad boys. Uh, they are opening over there on Gemini, actually. So one of the legion of NASDAQ exchanges. Now 3,500 of these going up. Worth noting, they do have earnings coming up on the 5th. But So this is not a earnings-related put. Also worth noting, this name has... A little bit hard to borrow, so you see a little bit more put love usually in names like that as a result. So Mr. Rock Lobster, we're vacillating all over the place, selling off today. Maybe not surprising we got someone piling into some puts. Again, not going through the earnings, which is kind of interesting. What's your spidey sense tingling about these uh, DXC puts, sir? You know, this is, this is one of those where I just, I don't, I, I don't see why you want, I mean, I can see if there are people are short the crap out of this. This is a, a fall from Grace Company, so it's it's actually new to me. I'm gonna do some more research on it because anytime a company goes from ninety to thirty, <laughs> you know the short interest is heavy. I'm looking at the reversal conversion markets. Let's see. That's when the rock lobster wants to know more when it goes from ninety. That's to 30. what I want to know a little more. So right now, like the third, so there's eh, there's about a half a dollar of borrow in it, maybe a uh, twenty. That's eh, not too bad. So. And there, it does pay a dividend. Um, so anyway, I, there's a story here somewhere. I don't know what it is. The, actually, the dividend's been increasing. So I don't know what the heck the problem is. Uh, maybe they had a bad earnings or something. But I, I, to me, this looks like a line in the sand put. If it was me, I would. That's what I would be doing. It was like 25 bucks looks pretty low, and the company's got like 13 dollars in cash. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm assuming somebody's taking a punt here on this. Um, yeah, it's got $10 per share in cash. So it's not like it's going to go broke anytime soon, I think. Um, again, this is all just uh, looking at it for the first time. But I, I may just go, oh, my gosh, you know, um, they're really beating this thing, hitting this thing with an ugly stick. So a... Um, I certainly like it better as a line in the sand play than I do uh, the I, I other do way too. around. Like you won't buy the twenty five foot where it's going to go to ten dollars or fifteen. Yeah, bucks. exactly. I mean, it's got uh, so something must be going on with it that I don't know. But it's I am now it officially is on my watch list because uh oh the rock um, lobster he's coming to play now. Yeah, well, again, in interesting, DXC. hard to borrow, vaults really kind of it's a, like a lot of like a lot clearly it's and a lot of it's earnings related. Uh, they've had the last three reports have not been great for them apparently. So, again, an interesting company increasing increasing dividends with stocks going lower. Something's not quite right, and you know <laughs> the market. You know the market. It certainly has no trouble hating something for no particular reason. That's, so. that's kind of a theme of our odd block this week. Is is Companies that are in trouble that have paid juicy dividends. <laughs> we had one on Monday, too. That was like a $6 name that was paying, what, 75 cents. So, yeah, that's kind of a bit of a theme this week. Juicy dividends on troubled names. As we keep on, let's see if our final name here can live up to the billing here. What do we got here? We've got no everyone's favorite, Novo Nordisk AS. This is another. This is a Danish pharma company. So if U.S. Pharmaceuticals, not enough vol for you. Let's go out to Denmark. <laughs> uh, Chicker symbol NVO. Trading today, 49.79, off about a buck or about 2%. This is the name that, as you expect for a pharma, had some vol. A year ago, it was trading almost exactly where it is right now, 49 bucks. Then it sold off pretty hard almost instantly. In early October, it was trading about 41. Then it kind of rallied back up to 49 again by January. And then by, so it looks like, the yeah, that hit its low around that, Around that October time frame, about 41 and a quarter. Then it rallied back up to about 52 bucks. Then it sold off again to 48, 46 actually. Then it rallied and sold off. Right now, it's, we're on another one of those cycles where it just rallied to 53 and a half bucks, which is about, about the 52 week high, 53, 55 actually. Then it sold off again to 49. So this thing is kind of all over the place, as you'd expect from a pharma name. Let's see what lit it up today. It's some puts, all puts today actually. The Ock 50s going up for a buck 45. So lifting the off. These are fairly tight for a Norwegian pharma put. <laughs> they were five cents wide. Maybe maybe something was lurking in the book there to tighten that up. Either way, going up 2,063 times in one block for on a sweep on the NOM, the NASDAQ options market to open them. So they had to sweep them to get these done. Worth noting a total of 2,600 have gone up on the day. It's another one where they have earnings coming up, 
but in November, so right after when these puts go out. So it's kind of a theme of the day here. A lot of October puts going up right before the November earnings. So a bit of a weird one. The 50 line, I could see maybe why you want to maybe buy some protection there because it has been well shy of that of late. Uh, maybe you want to carry that through a little bit to earnings because that's where I would be concerned. But then again, maybe they can't afford it. So Mr. Rock Lobster, 2600 looks like total of these OC 50 puts going up yet again, expiring right before earnings. So uh, what's your take on these uh, OC 50 puts here, sir, for about a buck and a half? Yeah, um, well, they're, they're already at money on them. That's nice. So, I mean, I, I, this is like the drug stocks are the red-headed stepchild of the stock market this year. That and oil. I mean, just they are going to beat these things because everybody hates the companies or Congress hates the companies or, you know, social media hates the companies. And then I, I always thought one day, like, drug companies should just stop selling drugs. Let everybody just, you know what, all you do is bitch, so we're not going to sell them anymore, and you can all go screw yourselves. And you go back to the battle days when you use sticks and stones, you know, to, to fix uh, ailments. Um, but anyway, uh, this is like an insulin, I like an insulin utility. Um, pays a good dividend. It's another one. Um, I, I, to me, this one just looks like a short term. I'm going to buy some puts and make some money, and it wouldn't surprise me if they close these in a couple days. I, I could be, you know, could be wrong, but um, it just looks like I'm going to just buy some puts and watch the stock go down a little bit and then move along. It does have that feel to it. They're paying up, but you're right. It's, it's nice when they're already making some money on them. That's a, that's a nice feeling. I know you guys out there can empathize with that as we keep on rolling. Speaking of you guys, it's time for you guys to join us on the show. It is time for the Thursday Mail Block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Mail Block. You guys know how to get at us. Theoptionsider.com. Got a great website feedback form there. At Options on most of the major social media platforms. If you listen to live, you can hit us up there, too, or via the mobile app. Carrier Pigeon. Questions at Theoptionsider.com. It all gets to us. Just like a bunch of you have here. Let's see how many we can get to today. Oh, first off, we got our old friends, Joe and Linda, the dynamic duo writing in. <laughs> I've said before, I said, wait, wait where's, the, where's the love from Linda? It looks like Joe heard that. He said, yo, Mark. Well, yo, back to you, Joe. He says, first of all, Linda says hi <laughs> and happy belated birthday. Oh, well, thank you very much. He said, hers is the same day. Well, again, I always knew she was a very wise and distinguished woman. This, that's just ratified to me now because she has the same birthday. As me, So congratulations to her as well. Then she got a question actually for you, Uncle Mike. So hope you got your, hope you got your question answering pants on. He says, my question is for Uncle Mike. He talks about rule number one and rule number two of credit spreads. And I was curious if increasing the delta exposure of the long side of the spread is another way of dealing with the short side being in the money. I have tried that with some success and wanted to know if I will eventually get bit. Thanks again for all that you guys do, uh, Joe. So Uncle Mike, he's, of course, referring to your now infamous rules one and two, which are don't let the spread go in the money, and if it happens, see rule number one. <laughs> but what do you have to say here for uh, Mr. Joe, who's, who's always looking, I can tell by his questions, he's always looking to tweak his spreads and do some adjustments. He's a very active guy. We love these guys. Uh, what do you have to say for him? He wants to uh, increase his delta exposure. How does that jive with your rules, sir? I, you know, for me personally, I, I've tried that in the past. It doesn't work well for me once it's happening. So here's what here's where it could work. On the put side, so let's say the stock's at 60 and you're selling the 55-50 put spread on the stock and the stock starts to go down a little bit. I don't think that's going to work well in the end just because of the fact that um, uh, when doing that, volatility is increasing and you're buying a higher vol. And if it keeps going down, you want to neutralize it that way, then yeah, well, maybe you could work that out where it won't hurt so bad. But then if you're thinking it's going to continue to go down, then I think you're better off just getting out of the spread itself. To the call side, I think it may have a little bit of valor to it, although it's still not my preferred method. So 
let's say that you're selling a call spread, uh, you're just uh, bearish neutral on the stock, meaning you think the stock's either going to stay the same or go down. So you go ahead and you sell a call spread stocks at 60, you sell the 65, 70 call spread. Um, as the stock's going higher, you could perhaps buy a another 70 call uh, when doing so or when that's happening because it could neutralize the delta a little bit. And the reason I think it could work to the upside, although it's definitely not my rule or my preferred medium, is because volatility will theoretically or most of the time be going lower and the call price on that upper leg of the call spread won't be quite as bad. Now, once again, if I ever do a call spread, usually I'm combining it with stock or selling like a covered call call spread instead of a covered call. But I could see it working in an instance like that. But once again, I think you. I think you're better off just getting out of it and going to, to try to live to trade another day. I'm typically a fan of you know. I, I've looked at almost every adjustment under the sun, and oftentimes when you're making an adjustment based on a loss, meaning you're trying to make, make one trade into a trade to salvage it, I usually think you're better off just getting out and starting over by maybe rolling up the spread or rolling down the spread or doing something along those lines. Uh, I'm very simple-minded, I guess, when doing that. But just from years of studying um, how to adjust deltas and how to maybe if the, uh, buying another call to neutralize deltas and things like that, often you, you have to remember that you're dealing with a lot, and I'm putting that lot in all capital letters and underlining it. You're dealing with a lot of moving parts in terms of uh, the six factors of option pricing. So understand that you might be neutralizing delta, But the other factors could still hurt you. Yeah, you know, uh, as I recall, I think he's written in a bunch of our other shows too, Joe, and he has, he likes to send in these positions that start off with one or two legs, very discreet, and then they start evolving with the adjustments into five, 10, 15 leg uh, monstrosities at that point. So he, do, he does like his adjustments. Mr. Song of Ice and Fire, I, I got to imagine you get this question or something related at the active trader strategy that's probably, I guess, every day. You know, they have a spread they put on for one reason, and then it moves against them. And then, hey, now what do I do? And so are you a fan of this approach of increasing the delta exposure? Or are you maybe, like Uncle Mike says, maybe get the heck out of Dodge and live the fight another day? <laughs> so it's funny you say that because I just had this conversation yesterday. How did, How did I know, sir? It's, it's like I'm Karnak here. <laughs> <laughs> you two for two. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, you know, when I, when I, the conversation that I've had, um, over the years, um, and from my own personal journey, what I've noticed is that a lot of times, uh, when we try to make adjustments, usually we over adjust and not look at what's going to end up or how our trades going to look after we make that adjustment. Cause it, it changes the nature of the trade. Um, I'm actually, like, no surprise. I'm in the same boat as Uncle Mike with this. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, he's got years of experience and, and knowledge of, of doing this. Uh, and from my own experience, it just solidifies what he's saying, that from my own experience of what I've discussed with other traders, usually just closing it out makes the most sense. Usually when they try to make adjustments or when I've done adjustments myself, it <laughs> usually backfires, which is what we're trying to avoid. So I usually just go with the method of have my outlook. If my outlook was wrong, look, walk away, close it out and try to find something that is going to make me money. Mr. Rock Lobster, is it three for three, sir? Are you not a fan of adjustments or maybe like a rule of thumb? We were discussing something similar on our options playbook show the other day, and I was talking with Brian about it, and he, he likes a rule of thumb of maybe one adjustment at the most. And then beyond that, you know, it's obviously not going your way. And so it's going against you. So, yeah, you close it out and, and live to fight another day. What is your general rule of thumb on adjustments, sir? So um, the uh, one adjustment is just making, I would say, like one roll and out as long as you think you can reasonably make some money at it. But generally, if you're selling an out-of-money spread and you kind of don't have any kind of volatility work, you know, and it goes against you, that pretty much means you're wrong in a big way. <laughs> so... Um, my idea for this stuff is what I look at is if you're going to sell spreads, I like hedging, like hedging with some sort of out of the money put. So I look at more as like a serial thing where 
because we have weeklies now, if I'm going to sell a credit spread. I want to make money on the credit spread. I want it to be a good credit, some, something that's going to make some decent money. And the reason is because I think the stock's going a certain direction. I just don't think it's going to go up enough to warrant buying calls, let's say. But I, I want to see if I can buy a downside put, let's say uh, a month out, but at a lower strike. So your short spreads, but long a put, maybe a month out. So it gives you four rolls of credit um, against the put you're long. And if you wake up and the stock's down a bunch, you know, I only, you know, I view that as at least you can kind of walk away from the trade. So if, at least in my head, if you're going to hedge something, you kind of hedge it early um, rather than trying to buy some options later and fix it, um, at least with, uh, a credit tester because you're, I mean, you can only make so much in the trade. Um, so, I mean, how much can you spend on adjusting? And if you're, if you're trying to adjust that kind of spread in more in time, you know, you usually have to spend more money on that leg. So, um, and I don't like the idea of like doubling down on a credit or doing something weird, like closing, like closing out your long side to just, you know, you're going to take the profit on the good one, but then leave you with a potentially huge loss on the short one. So, I ultimately with at least I found them um, unless they just want to take delivery on the underlying by selling put spreads. Um, the credit spread has to be some part of some regime where I'm going to sell a few of them. And I have a, like a protective option against the spreads in case everything just blows up. And then the goal there is just, I want to be able to walk away from the trade with minimum loss. Um, I have found it is kind of hard to close a credit spread if things are kind of blown up and going against you unless you already have something in place. Usually it's like, oh, we're down six bucks. I'm screwed. It's kind of hard to do anything from there. So um, that's how I would adjust that type of trade. Yes, I think a short answer to all this, Joe, it doesn't sound like any of us are really <laughs> on board with the, the adding the extra delta exposure, especially on the short credit spread. If it's, if it's already moved against you pretty aggressively, buying, legging into a ratio like that, for all the reasons we just outlined, it's, it's not really, I don't think any of our favorite approaches. Close it out, live to fight another day. Come back if you like. You know, if you like that spread at that point, maybe you can put on a different way to get that long leg exposure on that level if, you, if you've changed your outlook. But close out the initial one first. That's... A, that's probably, I know it's painful to hear that, but at the end of the day, that's the way we got to go. We got to keep on rolling right on into our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, let's go back the way we just went. Let's start with uh, the Rock Lobster, sir. We got ECB, we got Trump tweets, we got Val Fefe, we got a little bit of earnings left, but not a ton. What is on your radar for the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Lucky 13. Uh, we have Friday the 13th tomorrow. We have a big potential for VIX to trade into the 13 handle, which we haven't seen. I think until before the last FOMC meeting, before we had all this August hullabaloo. So those are two both both very big things. And anytime Tucson says never before the history of the U.S. stock market has it been a better time to sell your stocks, <laughs> you know that's where we are. Um, so both of those things we have, you know, all time highs for stocks. At least the S and P five hundred. The Russell's a little lagging, and VIX is somewhat. In on board, it's trading 14, but it's not trading 12 uh, like it was the last time about two months ago before all this stuff started kind of going nutty. So um, the market hasn't totally adjusted to the new SPX, so there's a, still a little bit of reticence um, in it. But those are the two things I'm watching. And we actually get into the Hurt 13 handle and hold it into the FOMC. That to me will mean people are. They're just kind of waiting for the trade deal now, and um, possibly, I know it sounds crazy, but much higher prices for SPX. So you live in that Vol Fefe dream, sir. <laughs> All right. And Mr. Song of Ice and Fire, sir, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week into the weekend? Uh, well, what I'm mind this week is, is my vacation, which starts tomorrow. So uh, outside of that, um, yeah, I'm still really watching, uh, you know, 
just general S and P movement, you know, uh, can it really hold this, uh, this 3000 level this time, uh, as well as kind of seeing if, uh, that strength in the Russell and, and the transports is going to hold up. And I'm also going to be watching things, um, just how gold and silver reacts. You know, they had those those huge rallies, and the, now all of a sudden they had those sharp sell-offs there. Uh, so I, I've been really interested in to, to kind of watch that price action. And then uh, there's some kind of Fed meeting next week. So um, I'm going to be kind of watching to see how it reacts, especially with uh, how the ECB came out today. So those are, those are the things I'll be watching. All right, and bringing it home, sir, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what are you watching in addition to all your Val Fefe love, sir? Uh, still watching the tweets, still watching the 3,000 mark, uh, and then just watching the Fed. I mean, this is <laughs> I'm watching everything. This is just a, a market to be watched, uh, and this is not the market to where you need to just uh, – I don't believe this is a set it and forget it type of market, to say the least. This is a market where maybe you need someone like an Uncle Mike holding your hand. During all of this topsy-turvy Valfet, easy for me to say, Valfefe madness. And so, as that music brings us to a close here, let's go back around the horn. Mr. Uncle Mike, if I do, I want someone to hold my hand through these topsy-turvy markets. Maybe to tell me not to leg into uh, extra deltas on my credit spread. Or maybe to manage those credit spreads for me. Uh, Where should I go? What should I do, sir? Well, by all means, go to my website, stcharleswealth.com. And if you are... Someone who likes to play around in the option space, but you're frustrated because you don't find any financial advisors out there that are uh, that are uh, uh, able to do things with options or even want to do things with options. I may be your guy. That's what his business card says, Uncle Mike. I may be your guy. Check him out, <laughs> StCharlesWealth.com. And I can speak from experience. There are not a lot of RIAs out there who who do what he does. We do a whole show aimed at that audience, and it is a very small audience, growing, thankfully, but still not a lot. So if you want an RIA money manager who can actually buy a put, roll them, that sort of fun thing, stcharleswealth.com is the place to go. And maybe, Mr. Rock Lobster, if I want to learn what I should do, maybe before I'm considering looking at an advisor, maybe I want to manage some of this stuff myself, and I need a little help, need a little hand-holding in that department. Maybe I'm spooked by all this Valfefe. Where should I go? What should I do? <laughs> Go to optionpit.com. Mark just posted a video on trading flies, understanding how to trade them. Also, um, I do a blog. I write two or three uh, articles a week. So you can learn for free even at Option Pit. Learn for free. I like it. It's like I built an entire business around such a thing. <laughs> Check it out, optionpit.com. By the way, we've got a new name for your, your Vol newsletter, the Vol FFA newsletter. What do you think, huh? It's very catchy. The folks at Morgan may have some issue with that, but hey, you know, let, let the trademark, <laughs> let the lawyers sort that out. You're just out there slinging the vol knowledge. Check it out. Go over there, optionpit.com. Sign up for his vol newsletter. Then he won't be so cranky on the show, <laughs> which will be good for everyone. And last but not least, he's not cranky. He's about to go on vacation. But before he heads out to parts unknown, maybe Mongolia, who knows? Let's find out. Let's go back. Mr. Song of Ice and Fire, let's say I like what you're talking about here. Maybe I want to learn a little more. Maybe I want to reach out and engage with the Fidelity Options team myself. Where, where should I go? What should I do, sir? Yes, you can always uh, check us out on fidelity.com slash options. Uh, you'll be able to see all the different tools uh, that can help you with the analysis for all your trades, as well as the services that are available. So at any point in time, uh, you want to learn about any of these subjects, don't forget we do have virtual online classes where our desk teaches them on several different topics from ranging from reading charts to to option and option strategies. So uh, certainly take a look, and if you ever want a one-on-one, you can always give us a call uh, and ask to speak with the uh, strategy desk. We're here to be able to answer your questions. You can even specifically ask for me. I'm always here to help out. Call up, ask for the song of Ice and Fire himself. They'll know exactly where you're coming from if you do that. Don't let the last emperor hog all the love or, or trade the last ad of Krypton. No, no, give some love. He hasn't been on in a little while. Let's get the Song of Ice and Fire some love. You going anywhere fun for your vacation, sir? Hopefully staying home. <laughs> nice staycation there for the Song of Ice and Fire. That means he'll be around maybe to answer some of your calls. Let's see. Hit him up. Fidelity.com slash options is the place to go. And on behalf of the Song of Ice and Fire and the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. If you're listening live, just stay tuned. We're going to pump some fun stuff in there. You want to talk about maybe some funky spy collars with a kicker? We got you covered. Then we'll be back here in exactly 28 minutes. 
I think we got my old buddy, Mr. Nick, joining us, as well as maybe some market makers from the energy space. We shall see. All sorts of fun stuff in store for Twifo. If you like talking crude, got some requests for maybe some corn options. Maybe we'll get into that. Equities, volatility, all that fun stuff. We've got it in store for you live in about 28 minutes. Or otherwise, wherever you're listening to this fine show, just hit play in the next episode, and you'll be good to go. Otherwise, we'll see you back here tomorrow for Volatility Views, and then right back again next week on Monday for more of the Option Block. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.